a front runner for the presidency of the United States is speaking positively about Bitcoin when even just like two years ago, that would have been completely inconceivable and unheard of. But now it's the reality that we're living in. I opened up my ex and then posts like five minutes ago were like Donald Trump was just shot at a rally in Pennsylvania. He's going to be pissed off and he's definitely going to use this. They've created this boogeyman out of him. What he was convicted for, it just seems absurd on the face of it. Just like, oh, an, an accounting error. That's what we're going to charge the former president for to keep him from running for office. The election at this point, it is a reality TV show. It's like the same dramatic flair as professional wrestling. Joe Biden cannot be president. I don't think he has the, the cognizant power to actually be in charge of running a country. Who was it and what was the intentions? I don't even want to consider what would have happened if that was actually successful yesterday. He's going to use that as one of his big campaign slogans. It's just like, they, they can't take me out. Well, it's not unusual for... Uh, Yeah, for, for leaders that start talking about changing the financial rails to be put in the crosshairs. So it's talking about positively about Bitcoin and negatively about CBDCs, especially when there's strong forces that, 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 that want the opposite of what he's saying. Yeah, it's, it's not unusual for them to uh, take out their opposition. So I don't know what happened exactly. And I can have, yeah, I have all kinds of crazy assumptions, but yeah, that was a wild event yesterday afternoon. Yeah, this, this was really crazy. Yeah, let's, let's start right into it. Um, yeah. um, before we cover like what, what happened yesterday or like depends on, on where you live, uh, even today, um, it's like the first podcast I record now after, after the, the shot of Trump. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's crazy to me how, how big of a wave this makes. And, and we can talk about that, but before that, like, What, what was your current, like before that, what, what was your current im image of Trump and how do you see him uh, heading up to the Bitcoin conference, heading up to the, do like a winning election basically and, and winning, the, being the first pro Bitcoin uh, candidate, the first pro Bitcoin presidential candidate that actually has a really good chance of winning, probably will win. Yeah, well, whether he's doing it pandering for votes or whether he's genuinely taken an interest in Bitcoin and believes that it can be beneficial to the American economy, like that doesn't really matter. Like the fact that a front runner for the presidency of the United States is speaking positively about Bitcoin when even just like two years ago, that would have been completely inconceivable and unheard of. But now it, it's the reality that we're living in. And that's kind of sends a signal to many other world leaders that this is this is a technology that's not going away and your choice is either to deny its use in your jurisdictions or to embrace it and we're going to see a lot of interesting game theory play out around that idea of just whether well, who, who who embraces it is going to potentially have such an asymmetric advantage with with the properties that bitcoin carries with it as like as collateral as as payment rails yeah i'm just looking forward to just seeing the next steps of, of like who who kind of starts coming out embracing this technology like we know that there's like there's a few others like we've got bukele who's very positively pro, pro bitcoin i don't know if you had a chance to speak with uh, maya parbo from suriname but she she seems like she's got a pretty good probability of of winning the surinamese election and she has very clearly spoken that she will embrace bitcoin as part of her policy and i've actually spoken with her a little bit she's very positive on nuclear power as well so that'll be a very very good um up uh, like interesting uh turn of events for another south american country and then on back to el salvador like the last week when they announced that they are starting the process of creating a nuclear power industry in their country that was a a huge development as well because now the bitcoin country also is embracing one of the most powerful energy generation technologies that we have so they can kind of be the front runner on what it may look like for nuclear power to be developed inside of a bitcoin standard in instead of in a fiat standard because some of the the research i've done recently a lot of the negative headwinds against nuclear power started in the 70s and as bitcoiners we are very much aware that uh, 1971 the us dollar was completely untethered from any uh, tie to gold and basically real energy in the world and that uh, gave an 
interesting change of, of how energy systems are financed. So now everything that's financed with debt, that doesn't really jive well with a with nuclear power that requires a very long time horizon to to plan it and consider it. So it needs a lot to different structure that yeah this the, the fiat system doesn't really align with. And if you look at the chart in the United States of nuclear power plant construction permits being issued, it just flatlines in 1975. And then also um, just re- looking at just recent other, yeah, recently I was looking at other influences around that time that started to gain a lot of power over the narrative, especially the anti-nuclear narrative. That was in like 1971 is when Greenpeace was formed. 1972 was when Sierra Club flipped from being pro-nuclear to anti-nuclear. The, the NRDC also was instituted around that same time, and they're very anti-nuclear. So it's very interesting to see a lot of the the um, the players that had a strong anti-nuclear position gained a significant amount of influence in the 70s. So even before Three Mile Island happened, there was many negative headwinds pushing nuclear power down in the markets. And then Three Mile Island happened, and then it kind of capped off and and killed what little what momentum there was and then and then even though it started to recover again in the 80s then chernobyl happened and then that set it back a little while and then it was starting to recover again and there was a lot of positive sentiment towards nuclear power in the early 2000s and then that kind of got derailed partially from the uh, the financial crisis that happened and then also fukushima kind of capped that off and then nuclear power has been in a pretty bad uh, bear market for the last 10 12 years and then Around two years ago, like roughly when uh, when Russia invaded in Ukraine, that put a lot more of these countries thinking about their energy sovereignty and reliance on external um, players for for their energy resources. So anybody that was reliant on getting fuel that was coming from a potential adversarial nation is now in a position where they have to figure out a new strategy or new new options for how they get they're going to how secure their energy resources and. And it made it clear, like being reliant on someone that's a potential adversary is bad, and like even being reliant on allies is is a risk in this this day and age. So it's so a lot more of these nations are starting to look towards nuclear power as a potential solution to secure their energy sovereignty because you the the fuel is so dense that you can keep decades worth of fuel resources on site and not have to worry about like constantly bringing in natural gas to power your plants or constantly re re uh, supplying your coal piles at your coal plants like it's nuclear power just it's it's in a category of its own with how much power it can generate over how uh, a significant amount of time so it's it's very re- refreshing to see that there's a lot of pro nuclear sentiment in the world basically it's like germany austria spain australia are like the four countries that are still vehemently anti-nuclear and like almost everyone in the rest of the world is like we want nuclear power and we want it as soon as possible like even in in the united states trump's pro-nuclear and then so is the democrat party they just passed the advance act last week in a very bipartisan support and then in canada we've got the the liberals are showing pro-nuclear and and the conservatives are also trying to say like we're even more pro-nuclear so it definitely looks like it's going to be a positive future for the development of nuclear power except we need to reinvigorate a lot of what was lost in those bear market years when they weren't attracting as much like human capital into the industry and as much like just like liquid capital to to finance these things so it's there's there's definitely challenges to overcome but it's uh Nothing that we can't accomplish. Uh, I, I, I love to see here, and it's definitely like Germany, Austria, like uh, where where I live. Like nuclear power is like, oh no, no, we should not do like that. that there's like uh, one of those topics. Even when you bring it up, it's like this this mainstream. No, 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 don't don't talk about. No, 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 that's that's not good. Uh, I, I mean, there are like some groups where you can actually discuss it, and and where like they actually have like good opinions on that. And there are of, of course also uh, a few. Uh, pro uh, nuclear, uh, even parties and and political parties and, and people here, uh, so it's not all bad. Uh, but yeah, I can I can feel that like being in that realm that it's it's not that not that uh, uh, well discussed as it might be somewhere else. Um, also, like uh, because you mentioned Maya, yes, I actually interviewed her like 
think three months ago, even like two months ago. Uh, we have that. If, if someone wants to check it out, it's on my channel. Just search for Maya. Uh, it's, she's the only Maya on my channel. So <laughs> you will, you will find her. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, uh, how, how the, uh, presidents and the political force all of a sudden comes into Bitcoin, comes into this uh, realm of Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, also with you now nuclear energy, uh, and and kind of takes a positive approach to that. I think that's that's fascinating. Like, who would have thought, like just just two years ago, that the uh, leading candidate of America uh, for the upcoming presidential election is for Bitcoin and speaking at the bit main Bitcoin only conference in Nashville. I mean, Bitcoin only like, but, yeah. but you mean, Hopefully you know what I mean? Derailed by yesterday's events, but yeah. Yeah. I really hope so. Like, I really hope that he still can come like, uh, it, that would be great. And we talked about it before. I heard that the next week's plans are already confirmed and then he will do the same as, as planned. Um, but b before we let get into all the other topics, um, how was that uh, when you heard it? it? It was probably yesterday because for you it's now morning. So yesterday it happened for you, right? Yeah, yeah. In my time, I don't know, it was about three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon. And yeah, I was just watching a movie with my family and then I opened up my ex and then posts like five minutes ago were like Donald Trump was just shot at at a, at a rally in Pennsylvania. And then from there, it was just like, who's, what, what motivation would be behind that? Uh, who like did, did it cause any significant damage? What, what, what other casualties were there? Because it does look like there was at least two fatalities involved in the event. But uh, And yeah, as far as I can tell, Donald Trump's going to have a pretty cool looking scar across his face. And he's going to be pissed off. And he's definitely going to use this as uh, as part of his rhetoric going forward, challenging the people that, that oppose him and probably the rhetoric that led to this event because the there's been some pretty extreme talking points comparing him to some of the worst people in history, but like, I don't, I don't see it. I, I don't know. It seems like they've, they've created this boogeyman out of him and, and they, yeah, they, now they're like scared of this own, this, this image that they created for themselves. Like it's hard, hard to describe. Like, like I got issues with the guy, like, with some of his policy, but it seems like most of the things that they get obsessed about the people that hate the guy are completely nonsensical like all of these if if he's so easy to go after then why make up silly things like the like the bleach thing why make up silly things about him saying things that he didn't actually say if if you just extend the clip by like 30 seconds it's completely different frame so there's plenty to criticize the guy about but it, it just seems pathetic when those are the most aggressively pushed reasons to to like deny this this guy the ability to actually like run for presidency and like the the what he was convicted for it just seems absurd on on the face of it just like oh an, an accounting error that's what we're going to charge the, the former president for to keep him from running for office like it just it just seems it's sad really <laughs> like just go head to head in a fair fight and let's see who can duke it out. Like I'm almost of mind, like put these guys in like a big brother or survivor type of scenario and like actually like have, have them compete in a re an actual reality TV show because the election at this point, it is a reality TV show. It's like the same dramatic flair as professional wrestling. It's like, just drop all the pretenses and let's just run it like a reality TV show. Cause I don't know what else we can do at this point. It is just turned into a circus. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it, it's a clown show, definitely. Like it's, it's something, uh, that entertains. It's something that you get emotional about. It's not something that helps you decide. Um, like I watched a debate, uh, between those two, I think like two weeks ago or something like oh that. My God, that was and sad. <laughs> my, uh, yeah. And, and my main takeaway was like, Joe Biden cannot be president, not because of any, uh, um, thing that he said, but as he talks, as he, like, he's not fit enough for presidency. Like for, for me, it's, it's clear. I mean, and it was clear before, like, it's like all of the news, like, oh, he's <laughs> like, it, it, a lot of newspapers thought like, uh, did like, it's a news that it just came up now that Joe Biden is, is not that fit. And, and there's so many speeches of him. There are so many, um, wonders off where he, he completely wandered off in, in the middle of the crowd. So like, it's it's fascinating for me to see it's that um, like they're 
oh. just parading <laughs> yeah. this poor old man in, around just because he's a perfect empty suit that will just sign whatever gets put in front of him. Like I, I don't think he has the, the cognizant power to actually be in charge of running a country. There's, there's definitely people that want to keep him in place because he is just the, the perfect empty suit for them. It's sad that it's come to that, but this is, this is where, what we have to deal with in 2024. And hopefully we can move past this circus. And in, in the future, we, we will have more impressive leaders. And the, our, our leadership class right now is not very impressive. And that's also kind of one of the things that worries me is like, we just had an assassination attempt against a potential president of the United States. And at the same time, leadership around across like the whole spectrum is pretty not uh, not high quality. So, which echoes similar situation to 1914 around that time when there was a lot of a lot of leadership that could be argued was not the most competent, and then they were very reactionary to event that happened, and then that spiraled out of control into World War One. So, I I very much worry that an event like this could provoke a wider wider. Uh, actions somebody somebody could become very reactionary to it and do something even stupider and then that can be provocative to to some other party and like i i hope it doesn't spiral out of control and things can can calm down and we can get through this election without any more uh, insanity but uh yeah it doesn't show any signs of slowing down like every every other week there's just something new that's crazy in this world what's your favorite uh or like your most probable Uh, theory that who was it and what was the intentions i don't know it was either someone that was deranged by all of the the, the trump is hitler rhetoric and, and really like believed it that they were doing something for the greater good or like it's not unfeasible that it was a patsy because we it's not unusual for for intelligence agencies to find somebody that's mentally ill and type them up to to perform an event like this so it's it's tough to say and like i i, I hope that it was something that can be contained and is not going to escalate. But I really, really don't want to see any more of this in, in this election because holy crap, that could uh, set, set us up for a, a very, very bad next few years if, uh, if the potential president of the United States actually was assassinated. Like I could, I don't even want to consider what would have happened if that was actually successful yesterday. That's uh That would have been uh, way bigger, I think. That would have been that would have been something indescribable, honestly, um, because all of the past, like like nine eleven, uh, RFK, like all of these things, like they were kind of in the past for me, um, or I was too young for that. So it's 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 interesting for me to like live such an event in an actual uh, real life where I'm uh, engaged and where I, I know all the things on the internet and, and can see all the things. And, uh, that's, that's something else. Um, l last point on this, um, how do you think, uh, Trump will use that? Like you mentioned it before a little bit that Trump Hill will definitely use that to, uh, for, for his campaign and, and for further, uh, uh, his presidency. What do you think? What is your theory here? Well, he's a showman, so he's definitely going to use it to his advantage. And uh, yeah, he's going to get up there and he's going to be like, they tried to take me out, but they couldn't take me out. He's going to use that as like, that's probably going to be one of his big campaign slogans. It's just like, they they can't take me out. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like, I, I can't say for sure. Like, I just watched this from the sidelines as a Canadian. Like, the American election is just like entertainment for me at this point. But uh, I, I certainly see it being a key point in his... Uh, campaign going forward yeah absolutely one thing that we should also mention i think uh that that someone actually died like uh, someone uh, as i heard it is like actually got the shot and and, and died and uh, i think two uh three other ones were, were injured um so like it's, uh, it's he, he definitely sure. a, a tragic e event for sure yeah um but yeah, yeah let's uh let's let's w one thing one last thing uh that we covered before like We also tell, we both saw it on X first. I know, it's hard not to talk about this because it just happened, even though it's just like, oh, we want to talk about Bitcoin. But yeah, like this yeah. is such a huge <laughs> moment in history. And like, it is like that. It's, it's, it's hard to not talk about that. And it's hard to, it's also like, there's so many strings attached to that. Like, there is uh, so many things that go away from that and, and so many speculations and, 
Uh, I think Trump did not address uh, till now any nations or something like that. Uh, would, would be really interesting to see when he does it and, and what he says there. Like, uh, I will definitely watch that um, because, uh, yeah, it will be very, very interesting. Um, the one thing uh, is like, we, we both saw it on X and, and we both kind of like saw right now the power of, of, of that news news uh, form when we talk about Twitter and there's all the news coming up in real real time and you don't have to wait for like someone uh, putting on, on on a newspaper, uh, which is really interesting for me because I looked at other social media accounts also and there was almost nothing or like just some, some small thing or some article reposted. Um, what do you think in general of, of like X and, and uh, how it uh, transformed with, with Elon and, and how do you like it? Well, it's fascinating that you can just be tapped into a live feed of a massive historical event, like moments after it happened. Like there was footage on my feed, just about from multiple angles, the the shots of of Trump doing the fist bump, and like uh, like footage of of seeing the like the Secret Service guys up on the roof, like kind of maneuvering to to get their shot. And like it was it was fascinating to be able to watch it play out in real time rather than having to wait until some news organization put together a well-crafted media presentation like that they do. It was like we were just getting raw feed of what was happening on the ground at the assassination attempt of a potential president frontrunner. Like it, it's insane that we can, we, that we live in this day and age right now that like that is, that is what we, we have access to. And it is then interesting because there's, like you and I and, and many others, we're, we're immersed in, in the X space. And then there's this whole subset of the population that isn't. So they were, they were not exposed to it in the same way that we were. And then they potentially like, there's going to be a lot of people that the only thing, exposure they got was through the traditional mainstream media outlets. And they're going to be given the, the, um, like the, the filtered version of, of how they feel it should be presented rather than just, this is what happened. This is the raw footage. This is the raw commentary that was happening at the time. You make up your own minds and go from there. And it was a, uh, yeah, it's a, it was a fascinating event. That's, that is for damn sure. I think we can, we can leave it at that. Uh, it was a fascinating <laughs> event and, um, starting the nuclear and, and Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining discussion, which is a really fascinating, uh, topic. But <laughs> in terms of this event, it's, it almost seems boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It definitely draws your attention. It's just like watching it, watching a car wreck. It's just like, yeah, hey, we're, we're all rubbernecking right now just to see like what, what, what's going to come of this? Who's going to, Who's going to say something incredibly stupid to to make the situation even worse? Like I just, yeah, I hope things can calm down and and we can move on and yeah, just get this election over with because Canada's got one coming up next year, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Canada is also interesting. Like uh, uh, Trudeau is right now the, the one leading, right? There's but there's one guy that is even consulted by Jeff Booth. I heard I forgot his name, Pierre. Yeah, that's Pierre Polyev. He's he's the leader of the Conservative Party. So right now they are looking like if there was an election called today, they would easily become a majority in in the in the Canadian Parliament. But the way that our elections are structured, because the Liberals have a coalition with the NDP party, which is the the third ranking party. Between the two of them, they form uh, a majority unless they rescind their support. We are stuck with the current situation until our election uh, would, be, would be about October 25, roughly, when it's uh, expected to be to be um, done. But if there was a vote of non-confidence, like we can have just an election called with, and then with like within two months, we're having an election. That's kind of what happened in the fall of 2021. It was just, there was a, a essentially the liberals called for an election, essentially saying that, that this was a referendum on their COVID policies. And then they, they timed it well because it was just before they started to lose a lot of support. And it was right at the highest hype of, of what was going on and they they leverage that to get an extra four years in in power otherwise we would have naturally had an election last year if it was on the the predetermined schedule so it was an interesting strategy and it seems to have paid off for them because now they have a 
majority government, essentially with their coalition, where they can pass whatever they want. And there's nothing that the other parties and the conservatives can do about it, except talk, uh, well, speak about it and voice their opinion about how terrible these policies are. Because there's a lot of like, uh, I think we just passed a hate speech law in Canada, which will make it very challenging to be very open about certain opinions online and it, it's but then yeah you get in this like well who, who defines what hate speech is like it's it that becomes a very slippery slope and dangerous uh, route to go down when when there is a chosen party that gets to define what is hate speech so that they that never never ever ends well and it always becomes used as a weapon to silence any political opposition by just claiming everything that they say is hate speech so i don't I don't like the way that, that things are going and that they're kind of running roughshod over how how they run the politics, especially when if you in, in the polls, they're they're just hemorrhaging support day after day, yet they're just acting like we don't care, we have the power, we're just gonna do whatever we want. So there's a lot of people in Canada that would that would like to see a change of leadership in our country. But uh we're going to have to wait, it seems. Yeah, hate speech for me is uh, just an excuse to censor someone. It's like, it's like if, if you're really a fan of freedom of speech, then you have to get through the downsides of freedom of speech, which means there are then also people that you dislike or you don't agree with they are also speaking. They they can also act on freedom of speech. They they can also voice their opinion. And and if we cannot uh, tolerate that, um, then it's just not freedom of speech. Like that, we sh we should be really totally clear about that. Even if it's hate speech, um, uh, it's 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 to agree. Like if it's not violent, like uh, it gets tricky because like you don't want violence, but like can you have violence with just words? Like the, it's like a fine line for me. Uh, because her words can really hurt, but like freedom of speech should be protected at all costs, uh, and we should tolerate as much as possible. Well, is limiting speech limits your ability to like think correctly and express yourself correctly, and and as far as I'm concerned, like yeah, if if I would rather bad ideas be exposed to like the free market of ideas where they can be challenged and they can be. Be, be put down by better arguments and that's why it's frustrating that the the authorities that like to push hate speech laws often aren't the best at putting forward or well the, their arguments are not at a high enough quality that they are easily challenged so instead of letting their arguments be challenged they will just say that any challenge to their opinions is is verboten and, and that they shouldn't be allowed so it just it makes it it just gives them too much of an easy tool to, to censor any opposition. I don't, I don't like the way that that is imposed, but yeah, we're going to have to voice, yeah, voice our opinion as, as strongly as possible that we, we, we reject any attempts to stifle free speech because challenging bad speech with better arguments is the way to go. And uh, like, I can kind of spin that into like the nuclear argument. Cause like, that's one of the things that I, I am very passionate about about nuclear power and and nuclear power has definitely has some some negative trade-offs there's there's no doubt about that but they're all often like out in the open like everybody kind of knows the risks of nuclear power and and and, and the, the, those trade-offs whereas a lot of the supporters of other technologies that are competing with nuclear power will often neglect a lot of their negative trade-offs they'll folk they'll 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 focus on all of the negatives of nuclear and oil and gas and then completely ignore the positive aspects while then look, pu pu pumping up their own preferred technology and ignoring like, okay, well, when windmills are spinning, they're generating free electricity. But then it's like, okay, well, how did they get there in the first place? What, how, were, how were they constructed? How much land are you occupying? How much material are you using? Do you need to build new transmission lines to actually get that electricity delivered to where it needs to be? How much subsidies are being involved? Do we actually even know what these things cost because there's so much distortions in these markets? It's, it's very challenging to have these arguments and discussions in, in real time because nobody really knows what any of this these costs because the, there's so much like fiat bad incentives permeating these markets that that uh, 
yeah, making an informed opinion about what is the most economic and effective power generation source is is totally up for argument, and it, it gets people very very passionately asserting like their preferred opinion on on these topics and and it's yeah it's hard to actually get to the bottom of it why is nuclear energy so important i think as an austrian and as a german i, I <laughs> i'm i'm kind of not exposed to the positive side of nuclear energy that much uh so like uh, give me like the the why nuclear energy is, is so important why we need it uh, and and why uh, we should embrace it in, uh, and not uh, other energies maybe Well, because like having access to electricity and, and, and energy is like vital for like social and economic development. And it, it it's funny because nuclear power is just one of those things that when it is operating as expected, as intended, it is very boring. And most people barely hear anything about it unless they actually live near a nuclear power plant and they know people that work in a nuclear power plant or they work in one themselves. Whereas when the negative things happen in nuclear power, that's what everyone, that's the focal point that everyone is aware of. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, like the nuclear weapons, they, they're they very well attuned to to the negative aspects because that's been like highly sensationalized when they happen, despite the fact that like kilowatt for kilowatt, like although this is like a cold analysis, but if you break it down right by the numbers, nuclear power on a per kilowatt basis is the absolute safest power generation technology that we have available to us like even just a few weeks ago there was uh, an explosion at a battery factory in south korea that killed uh, 20 something people so like those technologies also carry uh, their own risks associated with them that we are as we're putting batteries into much wider use we're starting to see that there there are negative consequences if batteries go wrong so everything can go wrong even storing fertilizer poorly can go wrong as we saw in the, the port of beirut a few years ago like every industrial technology has hazards associated with it and nuclear power absolutely does and like any other technology like airplanes we don't just stop iterating and making the technology better when we learn lessons that like yes there was a flaw we've learned it we're going to apply a solution to fix that that problem going forward so that it will never happen again like for example in japan after fukushima They shut down their entire fleet and then they had to start importing a lot of natural gas, which wasn't too bad for a little while. But then Japan's economy is is not uh, not in the greatest shape right now with their their currency and their their uh, debt to GDP ratio and all that stuff in their aging population. So importing expensive natural gas has created a, a, extra challenges on people's ability to have a high standard of living. So they're very aggressively trying to turn those their nuclear fleet back on as quickly as possible. And one of the things that they've done to ensure that should another tsunami strike the island, they have turned all of their East Coast nuclear power plants into fortresses with 20 meter tall, three meter thick walls so that mm -hmm. there's nothing that Mother Nature can throw at these things that would be able to cause a repeat of what happened in Fukushima. And then on top of that, because it was a failure of the backup generators is what uh, cause the inability to shut down the reactor into a safe state. They've put all of their backup generators on floating platforms. So if there was a potential for them to flood, they would just float up and down and they wouldn't actually affect the generators. So they would be able to continuously provide backup power should they have a situation where they needed to bring the reactors down into a safe state. They're very determined to get those nuclear reactors back online because it provides so much power to their, to their economy. And it's such a, benefit to their society to have access to that abundant power because japan doesn't have the greatest access to natural resources they don't have great coal resources they don't have great gas resources they're on an island with limited land so like solar panels are not the the best option um the way that they're offshore um like undersea is does not uh, accommodate offshore wind as well either so they're basically limited to either continuing to import gas and coal or reinvigorate their nuclear fleet so it's um it's it's kind of showing that yeah nuclear has it's 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 power density is just so immense that it's going to be like it, it is a great benefit to those that do use it and then what, what we're planning to do in the future with the next generation of nuclear reactors we want to make smaller ones that are able to engage with a much wider range of markets than our 
traditionally uh, sought by like large nuclear generators because they've always uh, tried to achieve economies of scale, build them as big as possible, and then you get your your the, the best economics. But nuclear power has the potential to revolutionize the uh, the power generation uh, dynamics in remote communities, where like in northern Canada, for example, we have to ship diesel and at very narrow time frames in the winter be, or during the year be, when the the roads are frozen because otherwise it's in, inaccessible to get it up there so there's very narrow windows it's very expensive to get it there so if we were able to build like small nuclear reactors in these remote communities whether it's like a community or like a, a traditional mineral mine they will be able to have fuel available to them for like five ten years without having to bring in a new um, new resources in order to top that up. So it, it completely changes the dynamic. And sometimes in, in some cases, like the, the, the levelized cost of energy of these new reactors isn't going to be competitive with some like on grid uh, generation sources, especially if like gas and coal are, are very cheap. And if it's like, there's lots, lots of solar penetration on, on these grids, it may not be the best, but in these markets where, where they're paying upwards of 50, 60 cents a kilowatt hour for, for diesel, nuclear power is definitely going to be competitive in those markets once we develop these new technologies and, and micro reactors and smaller reactors that uh, can apply to a much wider range of markets. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and simplest securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order, plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. It's a there are really interesting points already in there. And I feel like when we talk about nuclear energy, especially when, when I talk with people around the topic that are negatively around that, they often use the one argument that you already brought up with the accidents, with Chernobyl, with Fukushima. Uh, and this argument is for me never an invalid one because just because we found an, a mistake, a bug or whatever, doesn't mean that we stop developing if, if it's if it's a technology that has no future like we, we, we're like no no it's it's just not scaling or whatever uh, then like okay maybe we, we should not do it but if if the only reason is like there's a bug or there's an accident or there's something gone wrong then we would have no innovation at all like <laughs> every technology comes up with uh bugs with with uh, the things that we have to fix like whenever you start anything you will find some uh, challenges along the way. Like that's the most natural thing ever. Uh, the other thing that I have often here is uh, radioactive waste. Uh, what, what are we doing with the waste products of, of nuclear energy? Um, what is your like uh, tackle of this misconception? Waste is definitely an interesting contentious topic in the nuclear industry because like because of the nature of radiation, it definitely gives people pause with, with engaging with it. But as far as I'm concerned, nuclear waste is, is a treasure trove of potential resources that we can extract. Because for, for first, spent fuel rods in the traditional reactors are not fully utilized. They can still, like, 90% of the available power generation is still in those rods once they're taken out of the conventional reactors. And then that is why um, I think it's... France, Japan, and Russia all have um, fast breeder reactors that they can use reprocessed fuel and get further energy resources out of that. And then on top of that, like nuclear fission products, many have potential uses that some, some we haven't discovered yet, but there are many isotopes that can only be created in the with exposure to like a neutron environment like uh, like inside of a nuclear reactor or or an accelerator to create 
rare isotopes that are used for a number of different industries, especially in, in medicine. Like I have no doubt that, that like you or people you know, like everybody at least knows somebody that has encountered a medical procedure where there was a radiological isotope associated with it, whether it was for like sterilizing the uh, single use medical products or used as a, as a tracer or as like a, as a, like a cancer therapy. There's, there's a lot of different resources available in, in nuclear waste that we can extract and use for that sort of application. And then the other part of the waste is because of how nuclear decay works, it actually becomes safer over time. Like, yes, there, there are fission products that are short-lived that exist in nuclear waste when it's first extracted from a nuclear reactor. That's why they're kept in in the cooling ponds for five to six years before then transferring them into uh, solid casks for, for their long-term storage. And the reason for that is as the fission products, the short-lived products decay, they decay faster. So that is what makes them disproportionately more dangerous. And as they decay, they become a more stable element, which then decays slower. So if you're releasing less uh, nuclear uh, particulates, yeah, the alpha, beta, gamma, the different types of, of radiation that we have as, as that's being released, it is making those products actually safer to engage with over time. So essentially the plan is we want to create deep geological repositories where this, these materials can be stored indefinitely, but also in such a way that they are accessible for like the future to access them because we have no idea what technology will be developed that can actually find further uses for this material. Like for instance, one, one example that I like to use is, uh, is cobalt. I grew up in a community that, um, like back in the early 19th century, there was a massive booming silver mining community, but part of the tailings from extracting silver was cobalt. And at the time, cobalt was just a waste product that had no industrial use at the time. But now cobalt is a part of just about anything and everything that we use in our high-tech society. So there's a lot of efforts now to go and reprocess a lot of those tailings that existed from all those old silver mines and extract the cobalt so that we can use it for various uh, like like high tech um, instruments that we use nowadays. So the way I see it is like there's there's going to be some like we we don't know what sort of technological breakthroughs there will be in the future that will be able to make use of the material that is in nuclear waste and and radiation is just it's another industrial hazard that we're we're familiar with. And also like radiation occurs naturally in the world. Like we're exposed to cosmic radiation when you fly on a plane. Uh, if you have granite countertops, those have like a small amounts of radiation. Uh, like fire um, smoke alarms have, uh, have use of radiological material in them. That was actually how, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the story of the, the nuclear boy scout, but it was a, a young, young man. Uh, I think he was about 14 or 15 at the time he created a prototype nuclear fission reactor in his garage and the fuel that he got from that was extracted from, uh, I think it's americium. I, I definitely probably wrong on that, but it's the isotope that's used in smoke detectors. And he collected a lot of that into one location and he was able to use it to generate fission. And then, then he caught the attention of, uh, of, uh, I think it was the, the defense department. And then he got like, he, he went through a full full ride like scholarship and now he's a pretty high end researcher in in the uh, in the industry because this this kid was definitely a a uh, prodigy in the nuclear technology <laughs> he just figured this out on his own and and like working with radiation it's it's like working with any other industrial hazard because actually in the nuclear industry there's far greater hazards from the fact that we're working with electricity heat and steam and large spinning objects like those those are the primary hazards when when dealing with this technology like radiation it's it's manageable like def it definitely carries risks with it but it's very well understood and it's we we limit the time that you're exposed to it you use shielding and then we use like other just uh, other techniques to just prevent the exposure of workers to to radiation when they're working like i get exposed to radiation like almost every day but probably cumulatively less than somebody that travels on a plane like every at least once a month so it's 
it's it's it's a challenging phenomenon to discuss because it is so poorly understood, especially with the way that it's been portrayed in pop culture over the the decades. Like most people's only exposure and to to nuclear power is from watching The Simpsons, and it, that was not the the best portrayal of the technology. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll leave that. Yeah, I think uh, in, in general, like outside of Bitcoin, outside of, of nuclear energy, I think we we have a problem of of not critical thinking enough. Like it's sometimes it's just okay to say I don't have opinion on that because I did not do enough research. I did not do I did not collect too many information, and and that's what I do a, a lot of the times. I just like hey. And I cannot uh, say enough about that because it's, it's like just an area where I, I'm not an expert and I did not do my research. Uh, and, and I think society would benefit from that if we just like step, take a step back and say like, Oh, I don't want to form an opinion on that, even though uh, some social group would force me to do. Uh, and when we had more people of that, we would have more people that actually think critical about stuff and research about stuff. And then we would have, I think, um, better views and better uh, angles and perspectives on, 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 on topics that are maybe complexer or um, a, a little bit more, like they're not that easy to, to comprehend as Bitcoin, as nuclear energy, as Bitcoin yeah, mining I, in general. I definitely chose to champion two of the most poorly understood technologies that we have available to us. You chose an, an really interesting inter intersection. It's it's actually a, a interesting because when when you look at Bitcoin mining and when you look at nuclear energy, like why did you go in, in that and what's the what's the interesting? Well, I have been working at uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories for ten years now. So, and just disclaimer: these are opinions of my own. Don't represent the company. Just got to make sure that I put that in there just for for legal reasons because I'd like to keep my job. Um, because they don't have a position on Bitcoin just yet. I'm working on that. Um, but yeah, so I had been working at this company. Well, it, it, it's a, actually a crown corporation that's government financed because yeah, we the, the, the government supports the nuclear research. So then we support the entire can-do reactor fleet and do uh, basically material research, fuel research that supports the industry. Basically, we do everything except build and operate nuclear reactors. Like We used to have on site the, the original research reactors, but they're, they're no longer operational. They've reached the end of their life and they've since been retired, but we still support a lot of the operations of the, the broader can-do fleet and, and some extra stuff that supports the, the um, the other light water and pressurized water reactors. And then we're also doing a lot of research to support the oncoming generation four reactors. But that's kind of what, what led me to, to support like the, the small modular reactors and, and take that as, as my kind of predominant interest when I started to, to connect the dots of Bitcoin. Cause I, I have similar story with my, my Bitcoin journey as everyone else. Like I had a few touch points back in 11, 13 that just, I, I they never stuck. And then I ended up cashing out some Bitcoin in 17, 18 from an online poker site. And then I just kind of forgot about it and I just left that in a wallet. And then what happened was in the run up in 21, that around Christmas time, I actually started to pay attention and, and take it seriously. So that was I've, I've only truly been a Bitcoiner for about three and a half years. I have not completed my four year cycle yet. Um, and then it was, I just, I went right down the rabbit hole. I started with Max Kaiser's podcast. And before I knew it, I was listening to Safe Dean, listening to Robert Breedlove. And then before I knew it, my entire podcast catalog went from like Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson to just completely orange pilled. And it was around the time that Elon Musk had made his comments about the negative aspect of, of the types of energy that Bitcoin uses. And that was when the market dumped in, on, in that spring. And it was actually my wife that implanted this idea in my mind because I had gotten really excited about it. I had listened, I had learned about what uh, upstream data was doing with the capturing flare gas. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting use, use of this technology to, to eliminate the wasted power that was available on, in, the, in the natural gas fields. Where, where it got interesting was I was presenting these ideas to my wife, and then when we were when she saw Elon Musk commentary, she was like, "Well, why don't we just use nuclear power for this?" And she just kind of said it as just like, "Oh, that's that's just that's just a given." Like, 
why, why, why aren't we doing this? And then I, I had been kind of more immersed in the space. I was like, nobody's talking about nuclear power right now. Anytime nuclear power comes up in the Bitcoin space, it's like, oh, they just shut down Indian Point. Oh, they just shut down the Palisades reactor. Oh, they just shut down Pilgrim reactor. And, and then, and the German reactors were all shutting down. And it was not, it was, it was definitely a bear market for the nuclear industry. And then I, from my perspective, I was seeing what was coming because Canada has very aggressively pursuing what they call the uh, the small modular reactor a- action plan, where they want to nurture three different streams of, of new nuclear technology. Like one of them being like the micro reactors that I've already kind of mentioned that we want to use to to deploy to remote communities to upgrade them off of diesel, which I also believe that it'll have uh, great beneficial benefits to to many 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 places throughout the the developing world and like island nations and then the another stream they want to develop is is more akin to being able to replace on grid power generation sources like coal plants that are are serving moderate sized grids that aren't going don't don't really need like large gigawatt sized reactors and then the third stream that they're pursuing is uh more for industrial heat because the new fuel types and coolant types that they intend to use can achieve temperatures as high as like 800, 900 degrees Celsius. Whereas the traditional boiled water reactors, you're you're limited to how hot you can boil water at, which under pressure, you can get it up to like about 100, 200 ish degrees Celsius, which can apply to many industries. And and in some cases it's used for district heating in places like, like Finland and and in Russia, they, they use a lot of uh, nuclear heat for their district heating, but being able to push that up to 800, 900 degrees Celsius, that opens up a lot more opportunities for like petrochemical refining, just mineral refining, um, textiles, like concrete manufacturing. Like there's, it, it broadens the industries that nuclear power can apply to greatly it from from where it has been like there's still a range up into like the the thousands of degrees celsius that requires either like large induction furnaces or or coked coal to to get to those temperatures but as far as i'm concerned the more hydrocarbons we can displace from power and heat generation the more available that they will be to other markets where they will have a much higher order use. Like when we can, when we don't need to use as much hydrocarbons in, in power in power generation, we can use them for like combining different hydrocarbons. Like uh, with the cracking process, we can essentially design any hydrocarbons we want. It just takes a lot of energy to do it. Like if, as long as we have the, the base material of, of like uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen we with enough power those can be combined into any hydrocarbon at, at any length that we really want to it's just we're, we're limited to the availability of the power and comparing the economics of doing so to it's still easier and more economical to just extract oil and refine the oil and to, to get those hydrocarbons so eventually it might reach an inflection point where it's more economical to 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 do like the, the synthetic hydrocarbons but but yeah, like like I said, like as far as I'm concerned, we we can displace a lot of that out of the power markets and put them to much higher order uses. And and I like to kind of compare it like it'll be kind of kind of like a Jevons paradox idea, where it's like the more available we make it, the more that we're going to end up using. We're we're never going to not be using hydrocarbons. They're so embedded with everything in our society. And all I, I just see we're going to be able to start using them more economically and and more effectively and efficiently if when they're they're displaced from power generation that's interesting i mean um like full disclosure i have almost no knowledge about <laughs> like energy production energy things like i there were like already three four guests on that, that talked about that uh, so i get get some some in, insights in that um, yeah, i'd recommend getting but, someone on like uh like harry sudik or uh adam orloff from upstream data like they they're very articulate at, at discussing like energy mm-hmm. problems and energy markets. They're very intelligent guys in this space. I would love to like, can you send me afterwards like uh, an X handle or something like that? So I can look at, because I don't know them. But yeah, can, yeah. I'll poke them. Um, they like talking about this stuff. So actually Adam amazing. did a really good one with uh, the Bitcoin daily show with uh, wow, what's, what's his name? He goes by the doorman, Craig, Craig LeBlanc. Um, yeah, they host like a, a daily Twitter space um, every morning. On, on on Thursdays, the topic is specifically on energy and Bitcoin mining. So we got uh, we'll get into all kinds of interesting topics. And like one of them that was come came up this week is the uh, 
the incoming demand from AI. And a lot of a lot of eyes of are on what's happening at the Susquehanna power plant in Pennsylvania because that's where Amazon just acquired a partially complete uh, data center campus that was already partially begun uh, because of the uh, the joint venture between Talon Energy that owns the power plant and Terra Wolf that has stood uh, has a contract with them that they built a small Bitcoin mine and then on the side they were they were building a larger a high performance computing data center for with the intention of attracting a bigger fish. But then that's also caused another interesting second order effect that, that wasn't immediately apparent until, until it was, was raised a, about a week ago, that if you start pulling gigawatts off of the grid and putting them behind the meter, yes, that is great for the nuclear power plant, especially since they've been kind of getting a raw deal in recent years, because traditionally, like over, especially over the last decade, as more, subsidized power generation sources have been entering these grids. So the competitors to nuclear power are able to generate revenue by outside sources rather than just selling power into the grid. And then that causes all kinds of distortions. And then the nuclear power plants are often put in a position where they're either going to have to curtail their power or accept like very low or negative prices for for their power generation because like a wind wind farm that's getting subsidies can be profitable still when they're selling power to the grid at negative six cents kilowatt hour. So then if the nuclear power plant is exposed to that, that completely buggers up their economics. So there is an incentive for them to find a large static load that can always be available to consume their power and pay good money for it, which is which is like very like it, it, it makes it this this um, this change where AI is now coming for massive power uh, generation uh, assets, the the nuclear industry is very much paying attention. But as I was, as I was getting to and kind of got derailed, but when you pull gigawatts off the grid, now they're not contributing to delivery fees, and those delivery fees are what support the ongoing maintenance of like the wider transmission infrastructure. So now those costs are going to be amortized across a, a smaller consumer base, ultimately raising the costs for the end consumer in, in the other parts of the market. So there's so there's kind of a double edged sword. Like if if you're not contributing to the power, like the transmission infrastructure, it's it's going to change the the cost and pricing structure dynamics for other users on that grid. So I expect that it's going to be a little bit of a headwind, and then also. The, the company that is raising these complaints is called Exelon. And in I don't remember exactly when, but they spun off and divested in their nuclear energy assets that they used to own about four or five years ago. So now it, all that is owned by uh, the company Constellation Energy. So Exelon is the one that's raising these concerns. So some people have argued that it's like they're just kind of have sour grapes that they are no longer participating in this market. So then they can no longer they can't capture the benefit of attracting AI to their power assets because they don't own them anymore. So they're now kind of raising a stink about like, oh, well, if these other generators do that, it's going to cause more more issues on the grid. So it's there's always there's always trade offs whenever something major changes. It's like one gear shifts and then it affects another gear and then another gear and then we see all these effects that weren't immediately apparent when we were just like excitedly being like, oh yes, nuclear power and AI are getting together and we're going to see a lot of development in that. And then I also use that one to kind of point out that that it is in some ways could be argued that it, that it plays into Brandon Quittam's pioneer species idea where it's like the Bitcoin miners kind of came there and kind of planted the seed. And now it's attracted a much bigger fish into that market. And the way I see it is, is what's going to happen is AI is going to, to slowly displace the Bitcoin miners and push them further out into the margins where they will plant more seeds further out in, in like, in the marginal areas where electricity is is still kind of plentiful, but not the demand for it isn't available. So then they will make that more economical to develop that, those sort of power assets. And then as they become more robust and develop a lot more uh, infrastructure around them, whether it's uh, data connectivity or just like roads and transmission infrastructure, then it's more amenable for a more sophisticated energy buyer to enter those markets. So it, it does look like it's going to start playing out like that, that the Bitcoin miners are going to go seed energy products that were uneconomical as we're seeing like with what uh, Gridless is doing out in Africa. And then it will make the environment more attractive to energy 
buyers that, that need a more robust and, and resilient circumstances to operate in because like AI, the, the type of power demand and connectivity demands between AI and Bitcoin mining is wildly different. Like the Bitcoin miners are very rugged and robust and they can, they can operate in some pretty bizarre conditions that there's no way that AI uh, data centers would even consider until the market is, is, is matured and they can actually have confidence that they'll, they'll have the resources available to them. So, so they're, they're kind of competing for the same market, but not in, entirely like it, it it's 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 interesting to see these how these developments are playing out it's really interesting and i thought about like uh, the ai and then bitcoin mining kind of competing uh to each other um and, and the, the one thought that constantly comes up when you when you were talking is like market manipulation is on all levels bad <laughs> like when, when it subsidies and all this stuff like it it it, it manipulates just the innovation that the, that's it's fascinating um do you think and a lot of people in in when when i talk to energy people think that or like at least hint to that um do you think that we at some point live in an energy abundant system where energy is so abundant abundantly available uh that we don't have like right now this is like uh, when you look at mainstream media they're like oh energy is not there like we have to uh make sure we have enough energy and energy resources and stuff like that uh th then i saw that the energy consumption per uh person since 1971 is not really rising like it was just a little bit rising per person um the overall energy consumption was rising but when you break it down to per person it's 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 just a little bit rising what, what's your thoughts on like Uh, when we get more efficient with things and when we get more creative with uh, absorbing energy from the planet, maybe also from other planets, um, I had a crazy guest on who said like, we will uh, get mercury with, with solar panels and, and extract the, the, the energy from the sun in, in that way. Um, do, do we have the chance to live at some point in an energy abundant future? Oh, absolutely. Like we, we are, we definitely have the chance to, climb up the the Kardashev scale uh, if anybody isn't familiar with that it was it was just a um a a power consumption scale where a, a russian physicist came up with that was at, at level one this a society is able to consume all of the power that's available to it on its planet and then level two in the solar system and then level three is like in the galaxy and then you start getting beyond that and it starts getting crazy like godlike powers that we can manipulate planets and orbits and that that's getting crazy but like we are on the verge of starting to plant the foundation to get to that level one as as far as i can tell like the the, the pieces are starting to come together we have the, the available technology to start to 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 really head down that path but Yeah, it's just, it does, like, as you said, like the, the fiat system has kind of stagnated everything. It, it gives the appearance of a lot of technological development, but it just, there's, there's something missing underneath it. It's, it's like we're being denied all of the, the, the real fruits of our technological advancement. Like as, as Jeff, Jeff Booth describes so aptly, just, we should be living in a naturally deflationary environment where things are getting more affordable but that is being stolen from us by a parasitic class that then redistributes it to whatever they feel is, is necessary. And at the moment, like they put a lot of that technology, a lot of that capital has been directed towards building windmills and solar panels. And like, don't get me wrong. I, I do not have, I don't want no windmills and solar panels at all but as far as i'm concerned powering the foundation of a high-tech society we're going to need a lot more than depending dependence on the weather and i i like them for very hyper local scenarios like if you've got solar panels on your like remote farm that's in the middle of nowhere that is awesome and you should you should definitely do that but building fields and fields and like hundreds and thousands of acres of solar panels is just it, It's ugly and it's a blight on the landscape. And then it causes these negative side effects of, of where yeah, the further you have to get into lower quality areas and then you have to build out the transmission into it. And then like, yes, it's great that the power generated is free at the time. But then when you start looking at the, all of the 
externalities that go around that and how difficult it is to integrate that with the grids like that's where your costs start to, to ramp up and, and make it more challenging to bring these power resources onto the grid whereas like a nuclear power plant don't need nearly as much transmission infrastructure we don't need as much land we don't need as material as much material resources to build them it's basically concrete steel and uranium and in Probably in the not too distant future, we will be using a lot of lot more thorium for nuclear power generation. And there's even assumptions that, that many of the other um, transuranic uh, elements can be used for power generation as well. And like those, what I mean by that is just um, on the periodic table where you have like uranium, neptunium, plutonium. There's a whole other row of elements that have similar properties, but it's just uranium is the easiest way that we know of to generate nuclear fission because it's just you bombard it with a neutron it becomes unstable it splits it releases a lot of energy it releases more neutrons those neutrons cascade create more fission splits and then releases more energy and we've just we've learned how to control that in a very effective way to generate a lot of power and if we want to really build a space faring society like Nuclear power is going to have to be at the foundation of it. It's going to play a predominant role. Like I, I don't expect it to be like 100. I don't want to see like 100% nuclear power as as our, as as what we rely on. But I think it should at least be up in like half of our power. It should be like nuclear power, and every every nation on the planet should have accessibility to this technology. And like yes, there 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 is associated risks with it with with uh, bad players using it for nefarious purposes but the technology that we're developing now is going to be highly proliferation resistant like there the the next generation of nuclear reactors and the nuclear fuels that we use won't that won't even have to be a consideration as as far as i can tell whereas the previous generation of nuclear reactors like the can when plutonium is a fission product and then that can be extracted and then that's that's actually how india managed to obtain nuclear weapons was with their their nuclear reactors they were able to to refine the fuel in such a way that they could could produce nu uh, nuclear weapons grade material so so there was there was always challenges associated with that and that is why there was uh, a u.s imposed moratorium on the reprocessing of nuclear fuel that's been in place for at least the last 50 or so years and making it nearly impossible for other nations to develop their own uh, nuclear fuel supply chains unless they were independently able to do it like russia and china have been capable of doing so it's it's such a complex technology and it has it has it has a legacy associated with it as well that, that definitely makes it challenging to address in the few, in in the modern age because like like when they were extracting uranium in the the early 50s when they were aggressively trying to produce nuclear weapons during the cold war they weren't as considerate for the environment that that they were extracting it from or the people that lived there so there's there's those those legacy aspects and but now the modern industry is like, well, yes, we acknowledge that that happened and we have to develop strategies to reconcile what happened and actually make it make amends for what we did and clean, clean up any messes that are come from previous generations of this technology. It's, it's not like we're trying to keep it a secret that, that yes, there, there, there was definitely a history with this technology that, that is complicated, especially with nuclear power being able to be used for both peaceful uses and war like uses. So it's, disentangling those two has is is a great challenge especially for a generation that lived under the threat of nuclear war for so long and now that even with what's going on in russia like that is provocative with a nuclear power nation or that can yeah, that that has these weapons and like so now it's becoming a talking point again in geopolitics so i i would hope that nothing like that happens but yeah being being in this situation is creates challenges for for people that don't fully understand the the peaceful uses of that technology that that we can if we have a strong enough incentive to use it for for power generation like perhaps we can create a disincentive to be using it for weapons uses like that's kind of one of my interesting thesis because we, we did never didn't actually really get into too much of like the, the bitcoin mining side of this stuff but i believe that if bitcoin mining 
creates a strong enough incentive to be generating power, we're going to be seeking sources of uranium fuel from everywhere that we can get our hands on it. And like right now, it's most economical to extract it from the ground because there are still many very high quality, uh, um, uh, oh, let's say just like uh, places where, where it's found in the world, whether it's in Canada, Australia, parts of Africa, eventually it would be more economical. And if there is a strong enough incentive to be like, hey, there's uh, a lot of potential fuel in these nuclear weapons. And that's kind of what was was happening as some of the like Russia and U.S. have been down blending some of their uh, their weapons grade uh, uranium into potential fuel for these nuclear reactors. So, so yeah, my crazy theory is that if if a strong enough incentive is in play, we could lead to the depro deproliferation of nuclear weapons. So that's that's one. I I hope that Bitcoin could be that incentive. And it certainly seems like it's strong enough, especially now that we're starting to see like we can generate the scarcest asset known to man with electricity, whereas everybody else like BlackRock, these large investment uh, firms and asset managers, they can only get it by buying it or exchanging goods and services. And there's going to be a point in the in the near future where Bitcoiners are not going to exchange their Bitcoin for fiat dollars anymore. And that's going to be an interesting inflection point because then then it becomes a, either you have to sell a good or service or you have to generate power and generating power has many other positive externalities. So it's going to push us up that Kardashev scale by just wanting more power to obtain more Bitcoin. And then on the side, there's just going to be a lot more power available for society to, to like just abundance to, I love it a lot. Like, uh, you make a lot of sense, honestly. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it makes me bullish on Bitcoin mining and on, on the future itself. Um, when you look at, because you touched on Bitcoin mining, um, when you look at Bitcoin mining, uh, where do you see the future of it? Like in, in 20 years, how does, how will Bitcoin mining evolve? We have right now, like a lot of companies, uh, involved. It gets more and more competitive. The mining pools. Get, like it, it got more decentralized over countries, but the mining pools are kind of uh, centralized. How do you see the the overall future of, of Bitcoin mining when you look at 10, 20 years? Yeah, like definitely the like the, the pool stuff that's kind of outside of, of my scope. But like I've, I that'll get worked out. Just the game theory will 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 find a way, and especially with new tools like Stratum V two that'll be able to dis, dis, kind of more distribute um, block template creation to to a, a, a wider potential like group of, of, of miners instead of just limiting it to to the pool. So that's going to be an interesting development to, just to see how that gets worked out. Because every time the system seems to get stressed for one reason or another, like that's when the people, the builders in the space are prompted to be like, okay, now we, we, now we have a problem we need to overcome. We're going to build some tools to either work around it or overcome it. Like that's why like the lightning network was built to overcome like the throughput capacity of, of the main chain. And yeah, we, humanity will always find a way tech ourselves out of a pro any, any problems that we find ourselves in. But as, as this industry is maturing, like we're just seeing, like I've only been like really immersed in it for, for three years, but in this short time, it has matured significantly from like it was barely 100 exahash when I started paying attention to it just before the China ban. And now we're all, what pushing 600 exahash. And that's that's huge. But then we're also seeing the, the growth of many of these public mining companies and other private mining companies that have become very well adept at managing risk, whether it's like their their, their debt management, their financing, how they hodl their Bitcoin, the, the type of power that they, they seek out their they're showing a lot higher degree of maturity that, that this industry is getting to a point where power generation is starting to actually take it a little bit more seriously. Like there's probably still a little bit ways to go, but I think by the end of this cycle, having cycle, we're going to see a lot more engagement with large power generators. Like we're kind of seeing things happen like with out in the oil fields now that they're approaching the idea of being able to capture their flare gas. And that is a huge advancement for them. But then the way I see it with nuclear reactors, with this new generation, especially the way that we want to deploy them to remote communities, 
the risk of underutilizing the asset is a huge economic negative to them because if you're going to build power capacity somewhere where you don't have demand to use it all like the, the economics just don't exist that's why gridless does what they do like you they'll find a hydroelectric dam that's getting 40 percent utility and then they will make it get up to 100 and then because of the flexible properties of bitcoin mining they can complete sync with whatever the, the load and demand is in in that local jurisdiction so i see a similar strategy playing out with with like uh, the, the micro reactors that we want to deploy remotely. And I don't know for sure what's going to start evolving first. Like are power generation companies going to start acquiring Bitcoin miners and just have it as like a sub department that's just like, okay, this is you, we, we have this one little wing of our company that specializes in engaging with these flexible loads that can greatly benefit us in the long term. Or is it going to be the Bitcoin miners that if, if we do have like a crazy run up in the price of Bitcoin, like they have a lot of Bitcoin on their balance sheets, especially like companies like Marathon that are holding a significant amount of, of Bitcoin. If the value of that goes to the moon, like they have a lot of capital at their disposal and they will probably start considering just buying power assets wherever they can. And then I wouldn't be surprised if we also start seeing as, uh, as like the SMR companies are starting to get, through their licensing process and through all like the regulatory stuff and, and starting to see the finish line in sight, they're going to want to engage with the Bitcoin miners because just they provide such an awesome anchor load that they would need to ensure that they're going to be able to sell their power to somewhere, no matter where they deploy their assets. Like, cause it's basically just, we have the traditional conduits that we, push electricity through is the, the copper power lines, whereas now they have the optionality of a digital conduit that they can sell that power. So that enables them to use it as, as a buyer first resort. So when they first build their, their assets, they've got that consumer there day one available to take all of that power. And then as the, whatever the intention intended use was for that as that ramps up because the bitcoin miners are very dynamic they can either be shipped to a new location or they can be scaled dynamically to float around with with the power generation and then on the back end as like if it's like a traditional mineral mine they only have a lifetime of like 15 to 20 years so but the power asset is still viable for potentially like 30 40 years so the Bitcoin miners can just refill that space after it has served its purpose for the like traditional mineral extraction. And then they can continue generating positive economic returns on that asset because one of the biggest things about uh, the LCOE of building remotely deployed power assets is that the you get a better economic when like you yeah the economics work out better the longer that that power asset is in use so if you're only using it for 14 years to 20 years you're not going to get the full availability of what it has to offer whereas if we have those bitcoin miners in play like they they just they they can come and go so quickly and easily to occupy that space when it's available and it's just they're yeah the the people that want to build these assets are they're, they're going to start catching on sooner or later. And that is kind of my mission. Like I want to start incorporating it into these like modeling efforts for hybrid energy systems, because they, they, if they're not incorporating flexible computation, like at, at like right now it's predominantly Bitcoin that does the flexible computation. Like there's no other load that I'm aware of that has these properties. Like, like there's other loads that have the, like the flexibility that can be scaled, but I, where I see like, well, for example, like like hydrogen desalination, like the synthetic hydrocarbons, like all those can be like turned up and scaled up and down and, and power scaled dynamically when they're in use to make sure to capture any excess power. But where Bitcoin mining just dominates is the fact that it's dematerialized. Like if you're generating a product, like whether it's hydrogen or if you're making steel or aluminum at a, at a power plant in the middle of nowhere, like like in Iceland, for example, you then have to, you need storage and transportation for your feedstock, and then you need storage and transportation for your final product. You're not seeing the economic, you're not realizing the economic value of that product that you're producing until you get it to a market that you can sell it to. Whereas with the Bitcoin mining, it, it, it's available. 
to use anywhere in the world as soon as it's produced. Like you could have a Bitcoin mine in Iceland, like just say, you're, yeah, say you have like an S19 that's being hosted there and you just, you've got your brains wallet and now they pay out in lightning. So like every 10,000 sats, it just drops into your blink wallet. And then you're in El Salvador hanging out at the hotel bar and you can just be like, oh, hey guys, I just got my, my most recent uh, drop into my wallet from my miners up in Iceland. Let's buy around. And like, the fact that that is possible, it's just like, it's, it's mind blowing, but it's so too good to be true that it's hard to get some <laughs> the people that will benefit most from it to engage with it because it's just, it, it seems unfathomable, but it's here. And then how it is here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, it's, it's been, uh, already like almost one and a half hours. I usually aim for like an hour. I, I, I kind of overlooked the time already and it's been really interesting with you. Um, well, yeah, well, we spent 20 minutes talking about current events. <laughs> it's like, how could you not? <laughs> it, it, it kind of, I think we started like around uh, 30 minutes to, to talk about, uh, the nuclear energy. So like it, it kind of postponed the whole <laughs> schedule a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but I, I loved it. I loved the, the episode already. Um, we have an end routine of, uh, consisting of two questions. The one question is always the same question. Um, and the question for you, as the question that is always the same one is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin, which aims a little bit so we can get to know you in a different aspect, uh, in a different aspect? About me? Oh, I'm just trying to be the best father and husband that I can be trying to better myself physically, like trying to get back into doing jujitsu. I was doing it for a while, but then I, I hurt my ribs and kind of got out of it. So I think I'm, I'm back in condition that I can, can go back and definitely, yeah, I used to, to stay fit, but then I, yeah, I lost track of things. So I'm starting to reinvigorate myself to, to be exercising more, to be meditating more, to be just more attentive to the immediate needs in my immediate space. Because yeah, despite all of the craziness in the world that can attract your attention, it, it's it's focusing on what we have control of of in our immediate environments that that is the most important things that as far as I can tell. All right. Interesting. I also uh engage now more again since like half a year I was kind of sloppy with my exercise and now I started again uh, because it's like if if, if, if you really want to uh, do something great in, in, in the world you you have to do something great for your body first <laughs> it's like, well, like you don't Jordan have a good says, body in clean, mind clean up your room before you criticize the world so get your own affairs in order yes it's, it's, very it's cool. important um, yeah our end routine is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And then that's an interesting one, uh, interesting question from a previous guest for you. How would you orange pill someone if you cannot mention the monetary aspect of Bitcoin? How do you orange pill without, well, like I definitely have gotten pretty good at talking about Bitcoin without actually talking about Bitcoin because everybody's, everybody's kind of aware that something is horribly wrong, but nobody can really identify the, the causal source of it all. So, so it's just, I've gotten quite adept at connecting almost every social ill right back to the money. There's always a thread that connects to, there is just something wrong with the technology that we use as our money. And, and it, it's often comes down to finding the specific topic that is most important to the individual that you're talking to so sometimes it does require a little bit of probing and you can't just go like right right into like oh the bitcoin fixes this like you have to do do a little bit of navigating around what their their interests are and finding where it's negatively impacted by the just the negative incentives that are embedded in in the fiat structure that's just siphoning our energy from us it just it feels like when, when you start describing it to people that that the money is literally like almost a parasitic force on humanity it's that tends to at least get their attention but what i've noticed like there's a there's a concept in chemistry known as activation energy where it's like some chemical reactions when you when you put the the elements together they will immediately react whereas in other instances it requires an energy input into that system in order for the reaction to take place 
And if you don't exceed that activation energy, the reaction will never actually start. But once you get past that, that point, then it becomes self-fulfilling and the reaction itself will carry with it its, its own energy and pursue like itself right to the it, its logical endpoint where it ends up reaching uh, an equilibrium. Where I, I kind of been relating that somehow to, to bringing these new ideas to people where you have to kind of break through like um, an anchoring bias or a level of cognitive dissonance that that's uh, that just exists in everyone because we've we've all been exposed to things that that turn out to be like not as true as we've been led to believe and it takes a lot of effort to to get people to reevaluate their worldview on these complex topics especially when it comes comes to money and energy so it's it's just yeah finding finding the right way to approach any individual because every everything connects back to yeah where how we s store our wealth how we use our energy and how we uh, present ourselves in the world that's uh that's very true and uh and uh a, a cool cool angle of, of of looking at it um before i let you go before we sign off where can people find you if they have additional questions because we like we we covered a lot and i think we sometimes we we like to go deeper where can people find your stuff where can people ask you questions Yeah, on X, I go by Nuclear Bitcoiner. I'm also on Noster. And as everyone tends to say lately, it's like, I should be using it more. I want to be using it more. And I, I can often be found in the, the Thursday morning Twitter space that's hosted by uh, the, uh, the, uh, what's, what's the, the doorman and uh, macro minutes. And yeah, that's basically where I spend most of my social media time. And yeah, anybody that wants to reach out, those are those are always the best resources. And I love talking about this stuff. And anybody that wants to go go deep, I'm more than happy to uh, provide any resources that they're looking for, especially like podcasts. Anybody that wants to go into deep into nuclear, the Decoupled podcast is probably my go-to recommendation for anybody. Yeah, thank you for for joining us today. Thank you for for being here. And also for everyone watching and listening, thank you for joining us today. I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was fun.